So we'll start with limits first. All right, how about definition? Anybody remember the definition? Are you talking about the mathematical like epsilon is greater than oh. like There's only one definition of a limit for math, and it's that with an epsilon. As x approaches to infinity. So it starts with any. Oh, yeah. Epsilon greater than zero. There exists. So now that you guys are growing up mathematicians. Oh, here we go. So it says any positive epsilon, there exists a positive delta such that we just use colon. So there's such that. You can also write ST for such that. All right, how about the second part? The second part is usually remembered. Why don't you say you're going to have to have like a legend from <laughs> there? A legend? Yeah, you know, like in math, they have a legend what things mean. Like oh, <laughs> yeah, you can write your own. <laughs> <laughs> write your own legend. All right, let's go with uh, FX minus L. Nope, that's the wrong one. That's the second inequality. X minus, let's go with, we can either approach X naught or A. I think we're going to go with A. So it was an if then. So the first part was if X is close to A, then F of X is close to L. And we write it out like this. So what is changing when our function, <coughs> so we're not talking about curves, our input is now multivariable and our output is just scalar valued or just real valued. So let's think about what's going to change up here. So inputs are multi-dimensional. Uh, so what that means, x and a are vectors now or points, however you want to think of them. The other day I was looking up math stuff online. I heard someone talking about how to learn math and he said single variable calculus and he was using a different me method for using for learning multivariable calculus. I was wondering what the difference was between single and multivariable calculus as in is the inputs and outputs are vectors in multivariable? Okay, so we're now in multivariable calculus. We're getting there slowly. We just looked at uh, functions that had a vector output and a scalar input. Now we're going uh, vector input, scalar output. Okay. I think chapter 15 we do vector input and vector output. Okay. So we're going, we're increasing the dimension on the input now. Okay. Thank you. So <coughs> I should probably write that down. Limits of, so our function is now going from Rn into R1. So what that means, our inputs right here, x minus a, that's now a vector quantity. So what does it mean if you have a vector and you use these vertical bar notation? Magnitude. So this is a magnitude. Does it make sense to compare a magnitude to a number? Yep. Yeah, you're comparing a number and a number. So that's totally fine. The only difference is what I just underlined, <laughs> this is basically a vector magnitude now. Let's look at the output. So the output is scalar valued or real. So what you're looking at is two real values subtracted. So that's just the standard absolute value that we've been using for a very long time. So the good news is I don't have to change the way I write the definition whatsoever. So the definition stays exactly the same. If your x is close to a, the only difference is a and x are now vectors. So if I draw a r picture of what that looks like, here is A. So let's think about <coughs> points or vectors x such that x minus A is less than delta. What is one way to describe every vector that satisfies this property, every vector x that satisfies this property? 
So I can say these are all uh, X's that are within delta of A. So we're actually looking at a neighborhood or a delta uh, <coughs> ball around A. So that's what we're actually looking at here. So there's a neighborhood around A. And the radius is delta. So we're making a delta ball around A and saying that any x inside of here is going to have the property that the output or the, I don't really want to say y value anymore because the input is probably going to have the x, y, z. So I don't really want to say y value as the output. So I'm going to use the word output. So the output is very close to L. So if we take inputs from close to A, we get outputs close to L. That's all this is saying. And L is what? Oh, whatever number we said was a limit. Okay. Oh, so this, <coughs> this is the definition of a limit. Uh, our notation for writing this is what we've been using for a long time. Lim x approaches a. L is this number right here. And now remember, the only difference is x and a are vectors. So this part right here just means the vector x is getting close to the vector a but we write it exactly the same. So, so far nothing interesting happened. Same old limit. So how do you show a limit exists? Do you remember doing that? You take any epsilon and you have to compute the delta for it. That's how you show a limit exists, by the definition. So let's write down some limit rules. These will be the same ones from Calculus 1. We'll take both F and G are going to go from Rn into R. And limit as X approaches A, F of X will equal L. And lim X approaches A, G of X will equal M. And we'll let k be any constant. So we'll write down the rules. All right, what about the limit of a number as x approaches a? It's just going to equal k. It's going to equal k, the number. So this is our constant limit right here. So really k doesn't care what x is approaching. There's no x over there. So k is constant. So is our constant limit. Next up, let's do constant times the function. So we have to be careful about what all these things are. f is a function, k is a constant. So what can I do when I have a constant multiplied by a function inside of a limit. So I can bring the constant through the limit, basically. So I'm going to write it as k times lim, just the same lim without the k. And if we use the letters above, this was kl. That was a limit of the function f originally. What about the limit of f plus g? You can take them separately. So you can take them separately. So this is the sum rule. So we're going to write as two limits. So this will be l plus m. So we did uh, assume above that the limit of f and the limit of g both exist. So if they don't exist, then you can't split it up like this. So you have to have the individual limits existing. So 
So before we even look at multiplying these two functions together, does it even make sense to multiply f of x and g of x together? What are f of x and g of x vectors or real numbers? Vectors. So what is the output for these functions? A number. So they're numbers. So it makes sense to multiply numbers. Now if you say multiply vectors, you have to decide, are you doing a dot product? And if you're in three dimensions, are you doing a cross product? So multiplying vectors, you have to know what multiplication you're talking about. Numbers, we just multiply them, no problem. All right, so this vector, or these vectors, these numbers, uh, we can <coughs> basically distribute the limit across the product as long as both those limits exist. So we get LM, and we get the same thing for division. I'm just going to skip to the L over M for this one. Uh, what do we have to be careful about when we divide? Dividing by zero. Dividing by zero. So what should not be zero? G of X. Well, G of X could be zero for some X values. Oh. So the limit, which is m in this case. So this is when m is not 0. So as long as your denominator is not approaching 0, you can write it as the quotient of the two limits. And we have power rule. We'll take this to the nth power. Yeah, absolutely. It doesn't fail to work. I mean, it, it keeps working, yeah. yeah. All right, what about this last property I wrote down? When could this go badly? You can't take any power of any number you want. There are certain powers and certain numbers that don't work well together. So that would be one example. So I could infinity. have uh, basically a reciprocal power of zero. That would be bad. When n is infinity? Well, we're going to assume n. So we're taking a limit of, or we're changing the x value, not the n value. So uh, n is supposed to be a some finite number, or some number, so which implies finiteness. So the only thing that could be getting big is, I didn't write anywhere anything about a, so a may be uh, you have to be a little more careful. You can't just say infinity or negative infinity because it's a vector. When n equals zero, does that mean the number you'll get would be one? No, that's a realistic limit. So if, yeah, so if n is zero, there's only one base that would be bad with the zero power. Do you remember back to L'Hopital's rule? Zero. Zero to the zero is the time you have to be extra careful. Uh, however, in this case, n is constant. So if n is actually zero, you're probably going to have one because you evaluate if n is actually zero unless your inside function is also zero you're going to get one so even if it's getting close to zero a small number to the zero power is still one all right and what about uh, not keeping it real how about certain fractional powers with uh, negative values So any negative number better have uh, better not be taken an even power, okay? Or else you're going to get a complex number. So to solve all these problems at once, nope. We're just going to say when l to the n is real. So undefined is not real, and complex numbers are not real. So those are basically the two situations that could be happening. And I'm just going to call every weird case in L'Hopital's rule uh, undefined. Well, when they don't work out. If they do work out, it's just whatever L'Hopital's rule gives you. All right, so I'm just going to write someone's real. So basically, you could have undefined 
or complex. Those are the two ways that this could not be a real number. So that is all the limit rules we need. So let's go ahead and compute some. So the lowest dimension for Rn, aside from 1, is 2. So we'll start out in R2. That'll be our uh, domain. So our points in two dimensions look like x, y. You're going to hear me say the point, the word point and the word vector interchangeably. There is no difference. You subtracted two points before and then said it was a vector, right? You've done that a lot of times. Mm -hmm. You've also subtracted two vectors and said it was a vector. And you've added vectors and said that was vectors too. So points are vectors. They're the same thing. You Why just draw them. A direction, right? Points kind of have a direction if you look from the origin to the point. So you want to start thinking about points very similar to vectors. There's really not a difference. It's kind of just the way you treat them. All right, so our <coughs> what I wrote down here, it's basically x is approaching a. I'm writing a different x because I don't want to write, this is like the x representing the entire point, not just one coordinate of the point. So this x, y right here, this is the x, the point getting close to this constant point right here. And our function, we'll take an easy one. Let's go square root x squared plus y squared. So if we look back at the limit laws, basically I could push the limit inside the power as long as I get a nice number. That's what the last property says right there. You can push a limit inside the one half power as long as we're not going to get a negative number right here. And then we can individually push a limit past each of the square powers as well. So we'll do this one step at a time. I'm just going to write lim without rewriting the xy approaching negative 3, 4 every single time. I'm just going to write lim. I push the limit through the square root right here. Now I'm going to distribute the limit to the sum. And now I'm going to push the limit through the power. Oh, I lost my half power. That's not good. Okay, so any limit rule questions about the steps I took? This should feel very much like what we did way back in Calc 1, where we apply the rules one by one very carefully. Uh, now I'll rewrite my xy approaches, negative 3, 4, xy approaches, negative 3, 4. All right, these limits are super easy. Let's do the limit of x first. What is, don't even worry about the square, what is just this limit right here? Negative 3. Negative 3. So it really only, this limit only depends on x. It doesn't care about what y is in this limit, just negative 3 to the, <coughs> and it will appear inside exactly where that limit was. So that's 3 squared. And what about the second, the y limit? That will be 4. Uh-oh, what did I mess up with the x limit? It's negative. Should be ne I mean, it's going to be squared to be positive, but to be really correct, I should get negative 3 here. And then the whole thing to the 1 half power. And 9 plus 16. So we got five for this limit. As long as that was a real number, it was totally okay to push a limit through the square root. If this was some weird negative, 
uh, I would have some problem. This would not be a real number. Is there a reason you didn't just plug in x, y at the very beginning? Uh, yeah, w there's definitely a reason. How do you know you can plug in the x, y values? So if I just plug in A, that's what I would get, right? Yeah. If I just take X out, plug in A. This is the definition of what property of F? What do I need to know about F in order to say that these are equal? Continuous. If I know my function is continuous, then this is what's happening. And let's get specific continuous at what value? Nope, at A. So if we're continuous at A, I can plug in the A value. If we're not continuous at A, this is not going to be equal. Uh, and another way to write this that's sometimes extra useful, I call this passing the limit through the continuous function. But sometimes it's better to use this third version right here. It's not the definition of continuity uses the first two, but depending on what you're doing, sometimes that third one is really, really useful if you know your function is continuous. All right, so yes, you can plug in the value, but you had to know your function is continuous in the first place. So I'm gonna do two more examples. Go ahead and try the continuous trick. What's wrong? It's undefined. Function is not continuous. So what happens when you get zero over zero? Down. L hop. Well, what, deri <laughs> what derivative do you want to take? The x or the y? Uh oh. X. But why? I guess we have square. So two times. So we have an issue. Should we take the x derivative or the y derivative or the t some other derivative? <laughs> so that's a problem. So we don't know what derivative to take in L'Hopital's rule. What did I tell you in Calc 1 before L'Hopital's rule existed? You can still solve some of these problems. What did you use? It's the oldest tool you have, pretty much. Algebra. Algebra. <laughs> you remember algebra? Just nod or pretend, yes, I remember algebra. All right, let's do some algebra. Actually, I'll leave that up. Now, we're doing algebra with two variables, not just one. So before it was basically generally powers of x's and constants. Now we got x's and y's. What kind of numerator we can take out in x? So let's go ahead and factor an x out. That seems like a very reasonable choice. Uh, let's have an algebra zone. Set your day algebra. Yeah, you can do it. Remember, you can always do algebra before, after, or even during calculus. So we're going to have to get pretty clever here if we're going to want to cancel something. 
let's think about what is the bad guy? What is preventing? Which zero is the bad zero here? Denominator. Denominator zero. I can have zero in the numerator. That's not a problem. That's just zero. But that zero in the denominator is screwing us up. So that's the bad zero. So what that corresponds to, what I just circled, is basically the bad guy. We got to get rid of it. Can we square it up in the bottom? Let's take the conjugate. So there's a couple options. You c if you, the problem is you square top and bottom, you're going to find the limit of the square of this, and it's still going to be zero squared over zero squared. So there was one good thing said. What about conjugate over conjugate? So what conjugate should I choose? Should I go with x minus y? Would conjugate would be x plus y? Or should I go with square root x plus square root y? So why should I go with the second one? That was the one that was a problem. So I'm going to try to change that and eliminate it. So I'm going to multiply by the conjugate of the denominator. Actually, you can multiply by the conjugate of the denominator. I'm going to factor. I like factoring more than multiplying. How in the world do I factor x minus y? I'll give you a hint. One of the factors in the, in the denominator already. X. How does that factor? does that work? What is the product? If you FOIL this out, what do you get? X minus Y. X minus Y. They're conjugates. You don't have inside outside. They cancel out. So you got first term squared minus second term squared. Right? So there we go. Now, cancellation, easy. There we go. No problem. So we got rid of the bad guy. Or what I called the problem. It's gone. All right, algebra questions before we come back to calculus. So we had x times square root x plus square root y lim. Are we going to have an issue plugging these values in? So we got no divided by zero. The only other thing that we have to worry about is square roots of uh, negatives. And luckily, we're getting close to square roots of negatives, but not quite. So we got zero times square root zero plus square root zero, which is zero. So this zero, zero turned into zero. Hopefully, you remember doing enough problems so you can basically squeeze out any real number depending on how how fast you approach the different zeros. You can even go all the way to infinity or negative infinity depending on if you, uh, if the top zero, let's see, got smaller a lot slower than the bottom zero. This could even blow up to infinity or negative infinity. All right, so that was our next example. Let's do one more. What's the problem with plugging in 0, 0? We get 0 over 0. So our function is not continuous at 0. So that's not going to work. That's out. So what else can we do? Algebra. So we got some algebra ahead of us. we do here? Take 
<laughs> we don't have L'Hopital's rule yet in multidimensional. Yeah, let's do conjugate over conjugate. When in doubt, if you see a potential conjugate, So if I plug in zero, zero in this form, I still get zero over zero. So that didn't work so well. Our bad guy is still, still around. Change form a little bit, but still doing the same damage. So still going to have the zero over zero issue. Yeah, well, this limit actually, um, there's not many other algebra tools that we really have here, unfortunately. Uh, there was factoring and canceling, and there's really nothing. We factored a little bit last time, and that, that helped out in the previous problem. So there's factor cancel, multiply by conjugate over conjugate, and a third one, oh yeah, expand out and then cancel, like for polynomials over, and over another polynomial. So none of those are really going to work here. We tried conjugate over conjugate. I don't see any real way to factor anything out. <coughs> so let's talk about approaching from different sides. So in the good old days, so we're going to come back to this problem very soon. So hopefully you remember left and right limits, one-sided limits. So when we approached A, there was only two ways to do it. Those were the two ways. You're in a one-dimensional world. You could approach from the left or from the right. There was no above or below or in front or in behind or any other direction. That was it. Now we're in n-dimensional space. Let's just pretend uh, n is 2 so that what I'm drawing uh, represents what's actually going on instead of a third dimension that I can't really draw or a fourth dimension that we can't even imagine. So we're going to just think of this as two-dimensional. How many ways can I approach A? From all angles. So I could approach A in a straight line path from any angle. So right away, if I just say we have to approach in a straight line, we already have infinite choices. Now what if I tell you you don't have to approach in a straight line? You can approach in a curve. Well, if you zoom in close enough, they're always straight lines. <laughs> that was <laughs> they, well, <laughs> if they're smooth, I think I agree with you. If they're continuous. Or no. Well, but you can have some crazy fractal yeah. that no matter how far you zoom in will always look jagged. Uh, but I think if it's smooth, <laughs> anyways. Um, so <coughs> right away, we already have an infinite number of ways. So there's not two sides. There's already infinity sides. And I haven't even talked about curves that are not straight. Let's just draw a couple curves that are not straight. Uh, maybe some kind of parabola looking curve, something like that, like a fish hook or something going in. Uh, how about some crazy spiral? Something like that. You can spiral in. Uh, and of course, you can rotate these any angle you want. So any curve I draw could be rotated around. So the point of this is there's an uncountably infinite number of ways you could be approaching, even in two dimensions, that you could be approaching A. So we went from two ways to approach A to infinity ways to approach A. So we can't just say, hey, look, I found two that match. Therefore, they all match. We can do that before. You found two that matched. There was only two. So they all matched. Now, we can't check infinite paths. So what we're going to do 
If we think the limit does not exist, what we're going to do is find two paths that give us a different limit value. That only is going to prove the limit does not exist. Proving it exists, you'd have to test every single path, which is not possible. Is there a way we can narrow it down? Will it collapse the dimensions or something in order to confirm that it is a limit? No, but uh, hopefully uh, we'll do enough examples I can give you some insight as to why, uh, how to pick good paths that are fundamentally different that lead to different limit values. So when we think a limit does not exist, or to show so to show a limit does not exist, you're going to pick two paths. These are going to be alpha of t, which is going to go from r into r n. So in our case, it's just going from R into R2. So this function alpha is a curve, just like we spent an entire chapter looking at. So we spent an entire chapter looking at curves. So this alpha function is a curve. You're going to pick two paths. So let's go alpha 1 and alpha 2, uh, such that, uh, well, first of all, you need limit as t approaches 0, alpha t to equal a. So the paths better both approach the a value, or else you pick bad paths. So they got to end at the a point. I'm just going to write ai of t for i equals 0 and 1. So both paths have to end at a. Both paths approach A. It doesn't. T doesn't have to approach zero when uh, alpha approaches A, but you want to have a relatively nice value. Usually, it's going to be zero or one, depending on how we define our paths. But you'll see that in a few minutes when we actually create some of these paths. Uh, the second property. What, what's the one for approach? Approach A. I was just running out of room, so I didn't really put a space. There we go. So this limit turns into lim so it was f of x turns into limit t approaches 0 of f of alpha of t. So instead of plugging in x, we're going to plug in the wherever that path is going. And remember, that path needs to be getting close to a. So we're basically taking a n-dimensional limit and turning it into a one-dimensional limit. So let's do a slightly easier example. Do we finish our examples? Nope. Oh. We'll come back to it though. Oh, okay. This one I think will be a little easier, and then we'll come back to that one. It'll be a little bit more tricky. So our function here is y over x. So first of all, what's wrong with plugging in 0, 0? You get zero over well, you, you get zero over zero. You get undefined back. So what we're going to do is approach zero zero in some different ways. So what I did is I just graphed zero zero. Easy to graph. Let's think about some different paths. What is one way to approach zero zero? From the axis. So which one? We have four choices. Doesn't matter which one we pick. So let's go positive. x from the positive. So I'm going to call that alpha 1. We're going to go that direction. So a bad choice for alpha 2 
would probably be going down the x-axis the other direction. The reason it's bad, it's a little too similar to our original path. You really want to pick paths that are different. So let's see, we could go alpha 1 that way. Let's go alpha 2 down the y-axis. So alpha 1 will be down the x-axis, alpha 2 will be down the y-axis. So now we have to write out what alpha 1 and alpha 2 are. So alpha 1 has two components, has an x and a y. What is the y component of alpha 1? That's always 0. So as we agreed we're approaching on the x-axis, so there's no, uh, our y value needs to be 0. So we're on the x-axis. What about the x-coordinate? That better not be 0, or else. So I can't use x, but let's try t. Let's think about what t would look like. So if I choose t, does alpha of 0 equal 0, 0? Yes. Yep, so alpha 0, 0, 0. And if t is positive, we'd be somewhere on the positive x-axis. If t is negative, we'd be on the negative x-axis. So this will approach 0, 0, the way we, as we want. All right, let's go ahead and use alpha 1. Uh, let's write down alpha 2 now. So I want you to write down alpha 2. Once you see what alpha 1 is, it's probably easy to, to figure out alpha 2. Pretty much flip them. You want your x to be 0. OK, so we got our two alphas. Now what we're going to do is try them one at a time. We'll do alpha 1 first. So we're first changing our limit. <coughs> it's no longer x, y approach 0, 0. It's now t approaches 0. And let's write down our function. f of x, y is y over x. So it'll be a limit of f of alpha 1 of t. So I'm feeding the function f the output of our curve. What does f do? It takes the first coordinate. I'm just reading right off the definition of f. It's the second coordinate divided by the first coordinate. And that's all the function does. So it's going to divide second coordinate by first coordinate. So it's f of 0t. Okay, before I even take the limit, what are we going to get? Undefined. 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 Um, would that be the opposite? Uh, no, we want your... Oh, yeah. Right. So it's probably easier to change this to alpha 2 than it is to... because that would be more erasing. All right, so we did alpha 2 first. All right, now we'll do alpha one second. So repeat the exact same process, just use the correct alpha one this time. And hopefully you don't get undefined. What's our limit for alpha 1? Zero. 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 Does zero equal undefined? No. <laughs> definitely not. You could say they're reciprocals, but they're definitely not the same thing. All right, so we found two different paths that got extremely different values. So what does that mean about our limit? It does not exist. So if you find two paths don't agree, just like before, that means your limit does not uh, exist. <laughs>